going on, guys? Normally, we start this off going, hey, it's Brian and Jack from Simple Man's Comics, but we're not doing that this time. We are here. We are introducing a brand new podcast, Simple Man's Comics and Friends. The whole point of this podcast is to get our friends from the comic community involved in the conversation. This is going to be a new bi-weekly show. We're going to have this podcast, so you know it's going to be on the audio version. Make sure you check out Simple Man's Comics podcast wherever your podcasts are found. We're talking Google Play. We're talking Apple. We're talking Stitcher. But either way, Simple Man's Comics and Friends, new podcast coming at you. But before we introduce our guests, I'm going to get over to my co-host Jack and let him introduce how this podcast is going to work. Well, we're real excited to debut this new podcast. And what you are going to see on your screen is, of course, the four panelists. Myself and Brian will always be a fixture on the show, but we are going to bring in some rotating guests, some of our friends in the comic community, as Brian said, maybe some YouTubers, maybe some people within the comics industry to give a unique perspective. So it's not always mine and Brian's voice you're hearing. We're going to talk about four of the top topics going on in comics today could be the secondary market uh could be the publishing side could be the collector side and we are also going to close every show with a little bit of a lightning round to let you get to know our great panelists that are joining us as special guests with the simple man's and friends podcast the great thing about this one is and it's also super special because not only are panelists great guests who have their own youtubes and facebook pages but they are also simple men's comics patreon members they support the channel we've gotten to know them well we want to, everyone else to know them just as well as we do and introducing first out of the bottom left corner we have comic man andy andy king tell us about yourself real quick the beard <laughs> is on point the beverage is frosty. The topics are hot. And then coming out of the bottom right corner, we have Ryan Hayslip himself. Howdy, comic folks. Uh, looking forward to be on this here podcast to uh, discuss some interesting topics and to uh, have a little fun tonight. Right. So those are our panelists. We'll get to know more about them a little bit later on. But real quick, before we get into the meat and potatoes, the current events, the hot topics, we're going to do a little warm up and we're going to talk about how 2019 was for you in comic books. Andy, what was your 2019 in comics like? ASM 129, baby. We hit some major conventions, made some great friends, made some great strides in building, rebuilding my uh, personal collection. But the highlight of 2019 was definitely that ASM 129 in Baltimore and getting to hang out with you guys and uh, uh, a big portion of the YouTube comic book community out there. Yeah, and how about you, Ryan? Yeah, 2019 was really awesome for me. First off, I had my first child. Uh, Riker was born, which was one of the reasons why I started collecting comics. And I got one of my grails as well. Nice. Ooh, and, it's, and it's a newsstand. Oh, wait, newsstand. So, yeah, really good year for sure. But the Riker was the best. And for you, Jack? Um, you know, market wise to me, it was, it was the year of first appearances, um, year of a, a renewed big two reader buzz. We saw some of that moving from the Indies to the big two. Um, but also yet we saw independent comic creators take more control over their own careers and really sell themselves well using, uh, social media from a personal perspective though the development of this channel. This channel is obviously something Brian's had running for a number of years, but my involvement began in 2019 and we've really kind of uh, got this little tag team thing going pretty well right now. So that, that 2019 was a great year looking for a, a even better 2020. Yeah. I remember Jack going, I'm not ready. Of course you do. You got a camera, you got a mic. We're going to start. And then that's all she wrote. I would say the biggest thing for 2019, especially in comics is one of the things you talk about on this channel. We talk about integrity, but we also talk community. And to me, nothing was better than 2019 than the community. We got to meet a lot more YouTubers. We talked to a lot of people on Instagram, talked to a lot of people out there. Everyone's doing the same thing and it all comes to a great cause. Everyone's talking about a great hobby. Everyone has different points of view. So it's always great to hear those points of views. We got to meet some of those YouTubers at Baltimore Comic Con. We're talking about Comic Core talking about a bunch of other people. And I'll tell you, if you ever see us at a convention, always feel free to come up and talk to us. We're happy to talk to anybody. But from comic related point of view, I went back to instead of chasing comics, I just bought older comics that meant more to me, buying up that nostalgia we talked about before. So I bought a bunch more He-Man books, bought some more of those Marvel star books that no one really chases. It was more about personal collection. 
But I also think we saw a resurgence in some of those variant and we saw some hot artists. And I think indie books were definitely popular in 2019. So that's 2019 for you, but we're bringing it back to the present. We are in 2021 in February. One of the hottest topics coming out of comics this week. I don't remember a fervor like this in a long time. And we're talking about that DC Comics character punchline we don't bury the leads in deep into the show we're gonna hit you right out of the cannon with it punchline everyone's talking about it right now we got batman 89 we got hell arisen number three now you're seeing batman number 92 and 94 catch heat what do you guys think about this character what do you guys think about the storyline andy we're gonna start with you i know nothing i am not i'm not a traditional batman reader or a dc reader for that matter but there was enough I saw, I saw enough rumblings going on on social media, um, I don't know, a week and a half, maybe even two weeks ago. But I'm like, you know what? I'm going to add it to the poll list. I want to at least read it and see what happens. And I got a copy of cover A. Um, I'm going to see it through to issue 100. And um, against my better judgment, I'm not going to sell the book. I want to keep that run and see what happens. And, and you know, maybe hopefully this doesn't turn into that um, whole Naomi thing from earlier, from like 2019. But yeah, I want to read this through 100, see what happens, um, hold on to them. Maybe once I'm done with that, then I let them go as a set. What about you, Ryan? Are you, I know you're more of a Marvel guy. Yeah, but, um, you know, you couldn't help but see all the information and uh, all this uh, stuff about Punchline coming out. So it intrigued me. Um, that morning, I did go to the comic shop. And I went early um, just to kind of see what was going on. A lot of people were actually – uh, camped out. Uh, I don't know how much earlier they were camped out to get this book. So I, you know, if it's not something that I want and I can get access to it, I'll get it for my friends. And so I got a couple of, of, of books uh, for some friends of mine and was like, let me look into this. And my feeling on the book or on Punchline is DC is just trying to capitalize on some of the, um, some of the popularity of Harley Quinn that has maybe died off a little bit. And they're hoping they can continue on with this punchline character. And I don't think it's going to be, I don't think it's going to, I think it's going to be something they short live. I don't think it'll uh, go for a real long time. Um, if I was in the market to flip books, I would be flipping this faster. I think than I would be holding it longer because um, I don't know, just from my viewpoint, I think they're going it, to, it, it's, and, and it's also overshadowed the other character, which was what designer. So that I think might be actual the actual character that might have a little more punch to it, maybe in the long run. So let me ask you this, both of you guys. When you went to your, did you go to one comic book store? Did you go to multiple comic book stores? And were they cover price or did you see them marked up or were they just completely out? Or we're hearing stories up and down the narrative for it. The, I, I went and um, I got lucky, uh, had it in my pull box. Um, I went first thing in the morning when they opened and none of cover a and none of cover B even made it to the shelf. They sold out of everything that they ordered directly to their polls, to their, their poll customers. Um, I only went to one shop. I only frequent one shop. There, are, uh, there's another shop in my town, but that shop will take copies off his shelf and put them in the back when he hears stuff like this. So I guarantee you, if I went to that shop, there'd be nothing on the shelf in about a week or two. He's probably got them up on his counter for about 40 bucks a piece. He probably does right now. And like Jack's talked about, you know, I'm, I'm going to vote with my wallet. I'm with Jack on that one. And it's one of those retailers that will pull copies off the shelf or not even get them on the shelf when there's heat like that. And they'll, they'll price them at what eBay prices are a day or two after Wednesday. Yeah, I went to uh, a shop early in the morning and they had copies of um, the regular, I guess, copy A. And then they had uh, the, I think it's Del Auto was a copy or cover B. And uh, I, they would only allow you to have one copy of the book, whether it, and it wasn't, you can have one of each cover, you can only have one copy. So I got copy A, and then I did go to another store pretty, pretty quickly after I got that one, just to see if I can grab another one. When I got to the other store, they said they were all out, but as I was walking out, they said they had one more left. And uh, they did sell to cover, um, but there were a lot of stores in it that I anticipated sold, sold for more. Um, last week, whenever there was a big deal with the uh, Scotty Young Bear, uh, Venom cover, one of the local uh, LCSs here that opens an hour later than everyone else saw the excitement and jacked up the price on it after he saw everything was excitement on it. So I don't freak with that guy anymore, but um, I know he probably jacked up the price. Jack, what do you think about all this? 
You know, I think it's impossible to ignore. It's been maybe the most interesting topic that's been going on in the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, I don't love the prices the book's going for just as like almost a big brother to the, to the collecting community. I, I want to be like, don't spend $30 on a book that you really don't know. It could be the hundred dollar book, right? It could be this, she could be this next big thing, but we're like two weeks into her existence. Um, and so it's so early for people to make these kinds of moves. And I hate to see the FOMO that sets in where people have to rush and pay those prices. At the same point, we like to say, buy what you like. So who am I to judge um, what someone else is willing to buy? And at the end of the day, the excitement in the hobby is something that I enjoy. It's cool to me when like Ryan talks about the line outside the LCS in the morning. Um, you know, I frequent a very busy LCS and it's the same way, right? Where it's like, you know, they'll have people coming in and out on a Wednesday. It's days pretty busy, but then you have those certain Wednesdays where like the line is there and people, you know, all the flippers are out. And the, the cynical comic people will complain about that, but I enjoy it. Um, I think that that gives that kind of energy. I think the interesting thing is really how DC Comics handled this because you mentioned 92 and 94 also being hot. There's been so much of a miscommunication about what like is the first appearance. We just today had panels leak that indicate that Hell Arisen 3 is indeed going to be like a full appearance. Um, previously, some comments that James Tinian made made us believe that 92 was. This really muddied the waters about uh, what issues retailers needed to be kind of stocking up on. And anytime retailers run short, that's when you're going to start to see the games with people raising prices and things like that. Um, but Either way, it's been exciting. I, I, I would like to see DC handle it better. I'd like to see a little less FOMO in the community, but I think these things are are good to kind of like give that shot in the arm that we need. Uh, and it, hey, it's something cool to talk about. Do we know a print run for this book yet? No, no but huge. like yeah, 100,000. Yeah, and the last seems, ones were, sold out sales like figures were average around 75 to 80. So this will probably see an increase. Yeah. Wow. So the secondary market is probably the one that's going to uh, have the have the hit because if this if the comics the local the LCS is sell out, it's going to flood the second mar secondary market, and that's probably where they where I think that that's why I said it it's probably better to sell now than it is later because it's going to be so much availability out there. Right, and that's why we've yeah. talked about on the channel before that reader buzz books are the best long term holds because if the book is hot from readers, um, it stays in collections versus. If all of these books were bought by people hoping to make a profit, they're all going to eventually turn up on the market. Um, so the, this character's popularity has to not stay where it is. It has to increase or else you're going to start to see the dropping in price. Yeah. We've seen 89 stay kind of consistent with its value. Yeah. Wonder if the news coming out today and the, the panel shots coming out today affects that. I see it kind of lowering it, but I also see, that's kind of keeping that value right now because the news cycle keeps being fresh with punchline where you're talking about the 92, the 94. You also got a new character according to Tinian coming in 92 as well, right? Yep. Yeah. The unbroker. Yeah. Under I keep wanting to say undertaker. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the only, the only thing I had to compare this to is, is Naomi from uh, early last year. I just hope it doesn't become that huge bubble that bursts. I'd like to see this book, uh, if it's going to keep some steam, it'll keep some steam, but it'd be nice to see something uh, have, you know, some backbone to it and not just fall flat and die out. Like people were buying and buying and buying Naomi at inflated prices. And the next thing you know, they're what they spent is it's, it's worth half inside yeah. of like two weeks. If Batman's, if this 89 is going to be a $40 book or a $30 book, if it stays there for a while, that'd be great to see. Yeah, me personally, I would never pay this much for this type of book. But like you said, buy what you like. If you, It's your risk reward, right? So if you think uh, it's going to be worth more, by all means, that's your money. No one tells you what to do with your money for your comic book collection. What? You do what you like. I'm just excited. When's the last time we've talked about a DC book in the speculation yeah, cycle? Right? right? And, and I think it be – Go ahead, go ahead, Ryan. And wouldn't it be the writers kind of dictating this? If they keep that character in play – that's going to make the the long term uh, 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 popularity of that that of that character in this book go for a while. Like yeah. Andy was saying, he wants to see that he wants to see it keep going. It's really up to the writers, I think, at that point. Right. Well, that's why Ryan, I got a weird comparison for you. This to me reminds me of Jenica Turtle, and I say that because uh -huh. we're because when Jenica out, got huh? when Jenica got created, 
everyone's fear was issue 100 looming in the distance. What would happen with issue 100? And we're hearing the same things about this already is, you know, yes, it's all going to be up to what Tinian does with Punchline, but issue number 100 is coming and Tinian's already teased, you know, big events. So is this a character that's going to be long-term or is this cannon fodder for the early part of Tinian's run? We're going to have to wait and see on that. Um, I don't begrudge somebody though who pays $30 for one copy for their personal collection. I think do what you like. I, well, I think when I speak about somebody getting that FOMO, it's more about from a investment flipping perspective, but that buy-in at 30 or 35 or 40 is hey, you're rough. You're going to need to turn 60, 70, $80. We just don't see that that often um, from modern comics this quickly. Yeah. But right. if you're also, if you're going to spend that much for a personal collection book, me personally, I'll just hold off and get the second print. There had to be tons and tons of extra people who are casual fans of books and comics buying this book for it to sell out the way it did. Like the yeah. general, like the, the guy who's like, oh, there's a line out there. I'm going to go see what it's about and go buy it rather than knowing that it was coming out. So it did create a good buzz. Mm -hmm. Well, so I, I got to ask a, a question. What do you guys think, you know, with the debate back and forth about cameo versus first appearance, do you guys think DC's potentially capitalizing on that with this potential cameo potential first appearance and then they kind of blur the lines a little bit here it, it kind of what i'm seeing in the community is i feel like with the debate back and forth that that line is kind of blurred even further you think it's I something think, they're I, capitalizing it, on i think what yep, the community right what, i think into it, i think it results that way but i don't think that was the intention okay. i think what the community sometimes needs to understand is that writers are writers like they're they're artistic people um and their jobs are to sell their books they really, a lot of them don't have a grasp of how the secondary market even works. So we give them all this credit that like they're out masterminding these secondary markets. <laughs> um, but like Donny Cates is a prime example. Um, Donny Cates is, I've, I've described him as he's the type of comics fan who rolls his comic up and put it sit in his back pocket. Um, he's not bagging and porting, like he's not that type of guy. So he's not, he really doesn't know how the secondary market works. And I think James Tinian is very much the same way. So I think he got very excited to explain like issue number 92 and issue number 94. And I think that's what set speculators off. But I don't think he was attempting to deceive. Um, I don't think he understood the terms in which we use. And that's why I've said I hate cameo in first appearance because only we understand what that really is. Well, the only time it means something is when you got money tied to it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The, yeah. the Tinians and the Donny Cates, they can't tell you what's a cameo or what's a first full. We make that up as we go. And that's, <laughs> that's kind of where the problem lies. Yeah. I, I mean, if you want to get down to bare bones, I say 89 is the first appearance because it's the first time the person appears in a comic book. Although it's just Binox and another panel on a phone, but. Well, and you can go the other way. And I, I look at the panel. Lips. I look at the pair of panels from Hell Arisen 3 and say, I've seen more still considered a cameo so yeah you so, know buy what you like either way james tenian is writing a hell of a story right now mm -hmm. he's got let's, everybody paying attention to him let's not forget that that this book catching the heat that it did also has um an error floating around <laughs> so this book caught heat to get up to 20 30 i've seen some sales hair over 40 dollars um, the variants people are posting on eBay for five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars, and then accepting best offers. I don't know what those best offers are, but those error variants are selling for hundreds of dollars. Can we get a vote on who thinks these errors were actual true errors or not? <laughs> There's some of that for sure. <laughs> I, wonder. I wonder, but if you look at it, it's well, yeah, I don't know, man. That's a whole nother topic for a whole nother show. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about indie comics. Now, you know, indie comics is at the center of what we do here at Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel. And this week at Comics Pro, one of the talks of the event was Bad Idea. Now, if you're not familiar with what hashtag Bad Idea is, it's been floating throughout social media for the better part of the last year from former Valiant CEO and owner Dinesh Sham Dasani, as well as others and several creators within the independent community have been showing the hashtag all over social media, along with random artwork and so on and so forth. And now we finally have an idea of what this is 
It's a publishing company uh, with what they're calling a bad idea, and they're looking to revolutionize the market. So here are the details that we know as of right now. We are looking at a company that's only going to distribute their books directly to 20 stores to start, uh, eyeing towards 50 in the near future. So very limited distribution. They're going to lock retailers into agreements that will force the retailers to comply to certain guidelines, like one per customer, $3.99 cover price. Um, there's going to be no variance. They are not going to collect the issues in trade. Um, they're only going to release one to two books per month to keep release numbers down um, and allow retailers to really focus on those issues. Uh, this is what they're deeming a bad idea for kind of obvious reasons because uh, some of the things that are at the core principles of the company kind of fly in the face of the business side of comics. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. But with a roster like Jeff Lemire, uh, Matt Kint, uh, Robert Venditti, um, Marguerite Bennett, uh, Jody Hauser, they're coming with some of the biggest names in independent comics. So I pose this question to the panel. Is bad idea a bad idea? Or are you excited to collect these limited comics? God, you stole my joke, man. <laughs> He stole my, I was going to say, I hope this doesn't turn into a bad idea. So um, when I first dig into some of these reads and I'm first reading about this, um, some of this information you guys have shared, I'm like, I don't know. And right up front, I felt like they lost a part of me when they say prestige format. But Jeff Lemire, I mean, the, the, the writers and the people they have that they're lining up, I'm like, oh man, I'm going to have to get a new, I'm going to have to look at getting a new set of shelves. Um, three ninety nine, one copy per customer. The more I think about this, and and the more we talk about this, the more I want to call my LCS and be like, "Hey, can you guys get on that first list? Can you guys get in that first twenty or that first 50 I'll commit to buying one of everything that hits your guys' shelf at three ninety nine, because what is that? That first story that they're doing? Uh, help me out with that, Enac, Enac. Yeah. Oh, that looks good. That looks really good. My interest is really spiked. I'm really curious to hear what you guys had to think about this because at first I was kind of not digging it. Then I was a little torn and now it's really starting to win me over. Well, being that it's bad idea, I kind of like the bad idea, uh, bad, bad boy kind of, uh, or bad uh, company going against the grain. I like that. I've always been that way. Rebel, I guess. Um, but uh, I think you talked about uh, manufacturing um, scarcity or something along that lines. And are they trying to create, I want to know what the actual goals are really. Are they trying to create a book that's going to be valuable down the road? Or are they trying to create a really good story? I get the idea of having to have less stuff maybe on the shelf and making their book more kind of stand out or their story stand out. They're very, they want it to be a, uh, let, you have to have le, making less choices is good, and so and it, and it's going to be more of a prestigious book. But is it just them trying to create make make a story that sets their 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 company off so that they can be known as this company that just totally went off the what went off left uh, left field, similar to what like I guess kind of like what Image did or um, you know where they pulled all the all the artists uh, artists out and said okay we're going to go over here with do this we're going to be completely different. Um, it, it works for a while, but is that going to be sustainable? I mean, there's a reason why there's so many books being, uh, being made by Marvel and, and DC. And I understand what they're trying to do, but is that going to be sustainable? And what does it look like in five, 10 years? Right. I was going to piggyback off that also. Is this, if you're looking at it from business or marketing, is one to two books a month and a three ninety nine dollars cover price with 20 participating stores to start. That's a great start. How are you gonna finish? I'm also curious, what's the criteria to get on that list to be able to carry those books? Um, I'm excited for the books themselves. I kind of see this in the same mindset. I think it'd be successful, but I see it in the same mindset of TKO, but the opposite end of the spectrum where TKO wants to make sure that, hey, if you wanna read this, great stories, we, we, can, we got them for you. We got them in trade, we got them in floppy issues where bad ideas taking the opposite approach and they're saying, hey, it's not gonna be digital. 
It's not going to be trade paperback. It's going to be a single issue. We have a one per customer pledge. There's only going to be one to two per month. But just like TKO, they have this fantastic creator lineup to get the ball rolling on it. No doubt you're going to get great stories. There's going to be some great art. I, too, am not a big fan of the prestige format. But I like the fact that each issue is also going to be more than your standard 22 to 32 pages. It's going to be an oversized. So I think there's going to be great books. That I think this is going to be a great idea from a reader perspective. But you're messing with that reader perspective by creating that, hey, we're limited. We're only in some few stores. So you're going to have a kind of a clash of the two. I just hope it's successful because I do like the idea of it. I wonder about that as well as whether, you know, they're manufacturing scarcity or are they just setting the bar for themselves at a realistic level so that they don't burn themselves out and they're shuttering their company in a year? I, I really wonder. I think it's some of it. I think, I, I think the manufacturing scarcity thing is fair because they are trying to take um, a direct approach to the secondary market. Yeah, and be very boutique. At the same point, I look at it and go, this is the way I look at it. First off, I look at it similar to the way I look at Punchline. I think all things that make news, all things that are different, all things that are innovative within our hobby and industry are good. Um, so inherently, I think this is good the same way I think TKO is good, the same way I think Scout's um, binge line is good. I think that kind of in innovation is how we are going to continue to have this hobby even exist. I think you also have to understand who's creating this line. First off, Dinesh Shamdasani is one of the, not only does he have the pedigree of the fact that he owned Valiant Comics and during like the renaissance of them coming back and killing it um, and building into where they had a movie, um, the tanking of Valiant has only happened since he's left. Um, but also his partner is this guy, Adam, Adam Bang Freeman. Adam Freeman, A-T-O-M. Uh, Freeman, if you follow him on social media, he is a salesman extraordinaire. He is the guy that pushed uh, Valiant into comic stores when they came back out of bankruptcy. Um, he has run shops before, so his understanding of the secondary market is um, one that will allow him to probably put this plan into place. The interesting thing is going to be what's going to, I live in South Carolina. I'm going to tell you straight up right now, there's maybe one store within any sort of driving distance of me that may have these books. From what I'm getting is I don't think we're going to see them sold online. So right. only Yeah, it's only going to be physical yeah. there. In your shop. Yeah. So yeah. what is going to happen to those Iowans, uh, you know, or uh, people of Nebraska? Um, they, these books on eBay, in my mind, are going to all spike above cover price. They naturally almost have to. Because if there's any sort of demand at all for these stories, there's no way the supply can physically meet that demand. Because even if these stores are getting a ton each, like Brian said, if the requirement is you have to buy like two, 300 uh, of each title to be able to carry it, even if those stores are getting those, it, the access to those stores is gonna be so difficult because you have to buy them physically in store. Um, you're going to have to rely on a flipper market. It's actually going to be very good, I think, for flippers who live by a store who carry these books. And then it's going to be the onus is going to be on these books, on these retailers to not just limit one per store, but don't let, first off, to stick to that. I've worked with shoe companies where they, that's a part of your contract. And, you know, they, they do things like send plants in to try to buy two Jordans and see if you sell them. Um, you know, you may have to take steps like that to enforce it. it. Is bad idea in a position to do that? But the thing to understand is that the creators in bad idea are also partners. So I really don't think they have anything to lose, right? Because we're talking about Matt Kinn and Jeff Lemire. They've all got booming careers. Yep. This sounds like a really fun, almost like side project, test project. That's why I think they call it bad idea. Like it's on paper, this seems like a bad idea for a company, not because they can't penetrate enough readers or sell enough books. Um, I think the, the key loss is trades. Trades are where so many independent companies make so much of their money. So they won't be able to sell trades. So they're going to rely on so much secondary market buzz that it allows them to continue to sign up more retailers and sign up more retailers, sign up more retailers. Now by not selling the diamond, they're going to make a higher margin. And the only thing I'd say about the prestige format is I think they're trying to go quality everything which is why like they've been working on the they've written these books for the last year these book half of these books are done um and they're focusing on quality and i think because the 
DC Black Label stuff has been viewed as like the quality kind of book in our market right now. I think they were trying to kind of mimic that and give it that kind of um, upscale feel with the prestige format. I get how people feel about that. I just think that we're all going to have to get used to um, having those bags and boards and those boxes and um, adjusting to these types of releases. Yeah, it's like the aficionado uh, category of comic books where I haven't gotten on the prestige and I haven't really liked that format because it's pretty much DC <laughs> on the front lines of that. And at eight, nine dollars a book, I'm not a buyer for stories that I'm not into, nor am I going to change the way I'm collecting and storing comic books for stuff that I'm just not interested in re reading at, you know, eight, nine dollars a book. Three ninety nine. Now we're talking, man. One thing that I think that is also important important to know is that one of the partners in this is um, the partner with Dinesh and Hivemind. And Hivemind is the production company that has brought Witcher to Netflix, that has brought Bloodshot to Sony, that has brought, um, uh, or is bringing Gideon Falls to television. So yeah. the fact that the people behind this publishing company are also the people who are this involved in Hollywood production I think bodes very well for investors in these issues um, because I think they're going to get a lot of early attention. I just keep hearing prestige worldwide, worldwide. From <laughs> <laughs> the line mixer. <laughs> prestige Those worldwide. Knows. Knows. <laughs> so we're going to stick with talking about independent comics and we're going to talk about another big newsmaker from this weekend's Comics Pro event. Now, this started to make news before Comics Pro, but it had everyone at Comics Pro talking. And we're talking about a series of tweets from Boom Studios CEO and owner, Ross Ritchie. Um, Ross basically talked about Boom cutting down the number of releases that they released in 2019, which of course was Boom's really boom year, right? It was their landmark year, their year that they really had a coming out party as a major publisher. Um, and what Ross was pointing to was that he felt like Cutting down the number of releases that Boom released in 2019 allowed them to focus in on those releases. It was quality over quantity, and he feels like that was the key to his success. Furthermore, he applauded Image Comics for their kind of attempts to do the same thing and cut down their number of releases. And then he implored the rest of the industry to get on board with this concept and cut it down. Now, he looked at it from a retailer perspective. And we've talked about this on the channel, right? Retailers, they have so many books to order for their shelves. So I, I, I get where he was coming from, from a retailer perspective. My question to you guys is from a collector perspective, do you applaud what Ross Richie's saying, or do you not want to see some of your maybe beloved Marvel releases no longer um, be filling the shelves? I, I wholeheartedly applaud what he's done. Um, Cause the, the deeper I get into comic book collecting, the more I see squirrel, 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 squirrel. And I'm grabbing this and I'm grabbing that. And you know, Marvel's counting on me to do that by releasing seven, eight, nine X-Men titles. And I'm like, oh, I, I want to know the whole story, what's going on. Well, great. I'm buying the books, but is that for the best? Uh, there's, a, there's a responsibility that he's seeing on cutting back and doing what's best for his company, where Marvel, it's not sustainable. It's not to have, they, they can't have eight, nine, ten different titles of one mythos or one, you know, like, like world or universe. They can't keep that up. Comic book shops can't keep up with them on that. Like my current LCS that I favorite and I love and I, I, I go to twice a week, they have four shelves for Marvel just to keep up with them right now. And they're redesigning their, uh, their um, floor plan because they're running out of space. They're down to three shelves for DC because DC is a little bit um, cut back. Um, and then the independents, they're piling multiple independents on top. And, and boom, thankfully, with their cutback, their display has been phenomenal lately. I'm not filtering through a bunch of different things to find what I want boom related on the shelf if it's not on my polls already. But when it comes to image, you got like eight titles stacked onto one shelf and I'm like, well, I gotta sort through all this up to find what I'm looking for. And that's not what the LCS wants, right? So I wholeheartedly applaud this thought process and um, this conversation topic. 
Yeah, I'd like to have, it would be nice to be a little more clear, streamlined. Um, I collect mostly Venom, but when you have, like I think number 25 is coming out, it has nine or nine or 10 different covers. Yeah. It's like, that's freaking overkill. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's ridiculous at a, at, 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 a, at a point. And, you know, I, I think what's a new, what, you know, I had, I collected comics when I was younger and I got recently got back into it. And when I remember coming back into it, I was like, man, where do I start? There's just so much out there to look at. What do I, what do I collect? But there was something that was a little more let and, and you had, you know, I think they, they, they reckon it to go into the store, the grocery store and seeing there's so many versions of barbecue sauce. Well, if you had just a couple of versions of barbecue sauce, and you picked up that because you had just a select few, you're gonna make a quicker choice and it's easier for you and you'll return it there because it's easier and you don't have to worry about pricing and all this other jazz. So I, I would be, I like the, the thinned out in the crowd there. Well, you mentioned barbecue sauce. This is a very, very close comparison to the beer industry fighting over shelf space. Kid you not. Uh, oh, totally. Michigan is is the forefront of the craft beer industry, one of the forefronts of the craft beer industry, and we see this every day, people fighting for shelf space for their different beers. So the comic book industry is seeing that now. I'm going to say there could be a thousand barbecue sauces on the shelf, and we all know Sweet Baby Ray's is the one you get. Back. Sweet <laughs> Baby Ray's. <laughs> I, keep a couple, I keep a couple of bottles of that in there. Definitely so, my go-to. I'll say if you like sidewalk sales for comic books, then by all means, just make a bunch of different comics for it. Mm. But I also like what Ross is doing with Boom. I like what Image is doing. But ultimately, we always go back to this, or I always go back to this, is we've talked about on the show, like, hey, with so many comics coming out this week, I have to pick and choose what I buy because I always have yep. a budget. So if you have a budget, you're going to kind of stick to what you want anyways. But I do like the quality over quantity. Because sooner or later you get some of these, there's not everyone that's Donny Cates out there that can write eight or nine books and they all be good. You're going to stretch these writers that are writing multiple titles, publishing multiple books out. Sooner or later, the books are going to drag down. You're not going to have the quality of the story that you're going to have. And I mentioned it a bunch of times on here, like the X-Men books, the Jonathan Hickman X-Men books. I was kind of on board during those series. And I said, but wait, because I'm sure they're probably going to make like, six different eight different x-men series off of this and that's where i always lose interest and sure enough i'm of the mind where i think less is more but i can also see why collectors are out there going hey we're big boys we can make our own choice more comics is better and i'll pick and choose what i want to read well jack had mentioned something in the past that uh uh, collectors are completionists and i'm very much like that and i do have a budget and so because i do have a budget and i want to be able to capture everything i get second prints i do all i every cover that's come out i have everything in volume four but my pocketbook is taking a hit on that one title because there is so many different covers and it's and i wish there was less so i had less to, to, to have to go to, to have to go after but um uh, and wait till you so start yeah. buying for your kid yeah <laughs> i know he's gonna want something probably something else crazy that has 9 million covers. Every, I've, every I've been doing month. that with Batman since new 52. I buy three copies of each issue. Oh. For, so when they get to that age, be like, here's a comic book collection, take it or leave, you know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, but the thing about this for me, um, I think the cut down is necessary more from the big two than it is from the independents. I applaud Ross Ritchie. What he, what he was speaking of to like his company like he said, allowed them to focus. It allowed them to take every release. Um, And people know this because we obviously, like we were behind a lot of boom releases and we know like the care they took into every book that they put out this year. Like they really marketed the crap out of it, which if you're a creator owned title um, and you're a creator, right. And you're say um, a James Tinian writing once in future, you really appreciate the efforts that were made by boom. Another great um, point that was made uh, you know, through all of this is like the work that Boom's kind of marketing department has done this year. And I think that that is a testament to the people, but it's also, again, a testament to this idea. Like when you've got less to market, you can really focus. You look at like what Marvel's got going on and Brian, you get the nail on the head with the X-Men stuff. Like if they would have just come with X-Men, X-Force, and maybe one or two solo titles, yes, there would have been a plethora of characters left unused but they could have showed up from time to time Brian, you know as a venom guy 
part of what Venom collectors used to collect is Venom showing up in other people's books. We don't have a lot of that going on anymore because everyone's got their own damn book. So nobody <laughs> needs to show up in anyone else's book. You None need Raw, SmackDown, and NXT and AEW. <laughs> There, yeah, it, it, and, and so the problem is everybody's got their own book. There's no more of the of this like little monthly crossover. Um, these characters like Bishop, we try to pretend are main characters, and then we create all of these teams, and they start off well. Books start off well, and they peter out. The other thing to think about is is copyright law. So I think a lot of people aren't aware that like if Marvel doesn't use a, a title for a comic after a certain number of years, they actually <laughs> lose the copyright to that title. So like they released a force works comic last year because their copyright, Slapstick. their copyright, their copyright was just about up. So a lot of people don't realize that they're almost pigeonholed into creating junk. We don't want because they don't want to have DC literally steal it or, it, or an image creator take it. Um, there are actually a few Marvel entities that have actually, they've lost the copyright on recently some smaller teams from the nineties that some creators have talked about releasing on image and things like that. Um, or if night watch is one of those. I don't th I don't think night watch was actually one of them. Um, but it, in that era, you're in the right yeah. era of like, uh, of, there was a team. I can't remember what team it was though. It's, some people were joking about it because Donnie Kate said he would love to be involved. So it's the same kind of situation. So I think, um, I think that if Marvel could cut down their number of, of releases, it would allow retailers, when an event like Batman 89 happens, to be able to really capitalize on it. If you were to go to the average retailer and say, hey, something big is happening in Batman 89, you need to order more. How many of them even have the available cash flow to dip in and order, say, 300 more copies? Most of them don't. Yes, there's exceptions, but most of them don't. And they don't have the cash flow because while – you know, like Andy talked about, you know, you're picking your budget, your titles you want. The retailer has to guess what are the ones that Andy's picking? What are the ones that Brian's picking? What are the ones that Ryan's picking? And then what do I need to carry so that I get all of their money? And how many titles will I carry that no one will end up picking up? And as Brian said, end up on sidewalk sales um, and operating at a loss, which is just not the point of the hobby. So I think for everyone, less is more and should result in a better quality product and more attention and oversight to these things so that hopefully a publisher like DC Comics, when they have a punchline, can market it the way that Boom marketed their top line stuff in 2019. Yeah, pull list, pull list, pull list, pull list. Manage your pull list accordingly because that's going to benefit your LCS. Yes, and you watch that be. last call show on Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel yep. and make sure you get those FOC pre-orders in. Yep, and, I, and I like use, use that previews magazine too. Manage your yes. pull list accordingly to take care of your LCS because your LCS is going to take care of you. I like the last two, these last two topics because it shows also that the these companies are, are putting value in their stories that they're putting out. They feel so good at the, the quality or the, or the product they're putting out they're willing to take these types of risks. So that makes you even more intrigued on, man, if they're, they're willing to risk a lot of the, what, uh, what these other companies are doing, man, they got to be putting out a pretty good story or a pretty good, uh, 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 yeah, story. Yeah, that's a really big warning sign, in my opinion, though, when a publisher has to come out with a quote-unquote roadmap on the seven, six or seven different titles they're reading on how to read them accordingly, that's a big warning sign. When, when I have to be shown on a roadmap how to read a story because there's eight different books, like Brian said, no, 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 I'm done. <laughs> like when there's that many different titles, I'm done. Like so I fell into it like for absolute carnage. I, I, yeah, absolute <laughs> carnage. I didn't buy into because of that. I fell into it for X-Men because X-Men is X-Men, but they are ending. Um, uh, they're ending falling angels and they're, they're starting to, they're starting to dwindle that down and cut it back a little bit. So and obviously if they don't cut it back, I'm going to cut back on my own because I just can't keep up with seven or eight titles in one world. So if there's less books coming out, do you think you're more likely to spend more to buy the books that you like and then submit them for grading to CGC or it'll be about the same? Damn. That's a good question. Um, that's, yeah, that's good. I got uh, me personally. I wait for the community to decide on that. 
if 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 uh if the community deems that a book is going to be i have a price point in my mind with my personal collection when a book hits that 30 or 40 dollar range and i want it for my personal collection that's when i would consider setting it off if i've got an if i've got a very good 98 candidate that's when i'll send it off about the cost to get through cdc or cbcs or one of the grading companies and then get it back um that's where i feel comfortable for my personal collection if i'm doing my own submitting if i want to hit up uh, nick at slab heroes or something like that you know, I'll pay attention to his feed and what's going on. But if it's not for my personal collection, then, you know, I don't hit him up. Well, speaking of CGC and Jack's a big fan of this person, but it looks like we have Liefeld. Rob Liefeld's back in the news again, right? So CGC, they noticed they start, it's been around a little bit, right? They've had the character labels now and they have the, yellow character label for Deadpool, but it's the Scotty Young Deadpool. <laughs> and Rob Liefeld is like, I'm not going to sign this. And then it turns out that they got in touch with CGC. They've had a conversation and Rob Liefeld's just like, I'm not working with CGC anymore. Is that correct, Jack? Yeah, that's, that's where we're at with it right now, according to uh, the exciting Rob Liefeld Twitter, which whether you're a fan of his or not, you really need to be following his Twitter because it's just pure comics excitement. That is true. But how do you feel about this, Andy? I, I need to make a Twitter account just so I can follow Rob. Uh, like Jack said. Rob Eric, Liefeld's daddy. <laughs> that should be your Twitter account. He will um, block you in two seconds. He, he's entitled to his opinion and his beliefs just like everybody else is. Um, and just the same as CGC is entitled to run their company however they want to run it. So uh, wherever things are going to fall, they're going to fall. And I'm going to create a Twitter account and watch it all happen right in front of me. What about you, Ryan? Do you feel one way or another? Or? Hey, I think you're splitting hairs over nothing, really. I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it, it, I can, I can see it from his point, from at one, at one side, but at the, at the end of it all, it's, it's not gonna, it's not hurting them. It's only helping them. This could hurt him more than, than, than that little image on there. I, to me, he comes off as a crybaby, given the news cycle that's always surrounding Rob Liefeld. This is like typical Rob Liefeld. You've almost come to expect it from him. I'm taking my ball and I'm going home. But it also doesn't really matter to me. You know why? Because I can't think of a single book I would want Rob Liefeld to sign or send in to CGC grading. That's Rob Liefeld's. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> well, there's no such thing as bad press. That's the phrase that comes to mind. Yeah, well, exactly. So I know like on this panel, we may not have some Liefeld fans. <laughs> <laughs> but um, as the lone Liefeld fan on the panel, I will say, if you ever go to a convention that Rob is at, his line is epically long. I'm talking about as long as anyone you will see at the convention. He it used to be longer, I'm sure. Before he started going feet. I'm kidding. You know, but he is, um, <laughs> he is one of the most expensive at the convention. He handles everything through his booth. So you've got to fill out paperwork. Uh, it's, all, it's a very intensive process. Um, but the demand is there. So I actually, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach. And I know, again, I know that I'm the Rob Liefeld guy. First off, this is Rob being Rob. Is he a crybaby like Brian said? Of course, Rob is a crybaby. But at the same point, like that is who he is. And that, that is kind of like his personality. I honestly look at it from CGC and I go, kind of a bonehead move on their part. Um, they could have avoided this entire thing if they just did what probably I would have done, if I was creating the, the label, I would have used a Liefeld image of Deadpool being that he's the most known artist of Deadpool. Most of the images that are burnt into your brain of Deadpool. And are, the label doesn't even have feet. So you're perfect. I was going to say, right. if, maybe they wanted feet. I mean, you know, right. he just, he just wanted to get this off his chest and he didn't care about the agony of defeat. Yeah, and, and, and <laughs> oh my god! Wow. <laughs> the funniest thing about the feet got dad jokes already. The funniest yeah. thing about the the funniest thing about the feet argument is Rob has gone on tirades on Twitter where he's shown you how many popular artists also avoid feet. That's actually more common than I think people people realize. Go watch how That's many times publicity he likes though. He's like, yeah, I'm the bad <laughs> he, guy. He has no oh, problem. He's the one that did right. bad chest too, right? He has no problem. Oh, he has, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, has, he has no problem with being that guy. But that's the point. So he came out and voiced his concern, you know, saying, I'm not going to take part in these labels because presumably, right, we're assuming he was offended 
that they didn't use his image and they instead used Scotty Young's, which I get being offended. I don't think I would take it to that level, but there's a part of me that would be hurt that if you wanted to represent my character, that your ideal of that character was anyone other than my drawing. That's a fair point. So, you know, that's the point is like, all of these books that are going to get slabbed are now going to have this Scotty Young image on it. Um, <laughs> you mean it's 98? Which, by it's the way, like, I, it's the ninety, it's the ninety nine, and that's the only or ninety eight. That's the only reason why they put that on there. Really. Oh no it doubt, says, but I actually please. think the cartoony Scotty Young image will, in a way, take away from some of these classic. Um, oh yeah, kind of first appearances, in my opinion. But I, the the pulling away from CGC altogether, I think, has an effect because, like I said, I've seen the crazy lines at his booth. I've seen how much business he does with CGC. No matter how much the narrative online is rob is a lunatic and he's a baby i promise you within cgc they're like oh shit we just lost a whole lot of uh ss money but do you think he's somewhat butthurt over mcfarlane um yeah i mean maybe but that's that's we're all guessing that like but we talked about the mcfarlane thing my hope from the mcfarlane thing was that we were going to see more people doing that and rob would have been a prime candidate to take and do a private signing with. If you had a private signing with Rob, you'd have 9 million <laughs> New Mutants 98 signed overnight. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I- I'm sure that's some of it, but I-, I just think that when this, I think when this image came out, it bothered him. And then I think when he made the statement, Nick from Slabbed Heroes reposted it. And, and he had some very strong opinions of, uh, you know, saying he would never sell Rob Liefeld graded books again because he's not taking part in the hobby rob actually responded to that with like a sarcastic like good (laughs) and and uh and this is the thing is that when people like nick who's you know how many books he's subs to cgc when they complain to cgc cgc pays attention so then they got in touch with rob and i don't know how that phone call went apparently that phone call went terrible (laughs) because it, it resulted in the total breakup if I'm CBCS, I'm sitting back tomorrow. I'm calling Rob. Like, <laughs> what? You want the Rob Liefeld exclusive uh, yeah. label? What do we need to do? What do we have to do? Because CBCS it's gonna, have, it's gonna have Rob Liefeld Deadpool holograms in the yeah. case. Because yeah. CBCS has had nothing going for a while. Um, but it's also important to note Rob isn't the first one to do this because Jim Starlin had issues yeah. with CGC. Um, there's been people who have had issues with CGC and the way they go about their business and who have pulled away from them in the past. The other thing is some people have pulled away from CGC and then come back. So will Rob come back? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think it's just going to get smaller because those people lining up to get something signed are usually having something witnessed. But that's the question. You can still get it witnessed. Would you get it witnessed? Do you think those diehard Liefeld fans, are going to get books signed by CBCS or just say, screw it, I'm not going to get the book signed all together? I, th- I think they'll do the third party. Um, there's plenty of third party companies out there to do witness signatures and then take it on over to CGC. But they won't let you, perfect- they will, Rob won't let you do that. His booth is run differently. He has security in his booth. You have to fill out the form at his booth. Everything has to be done there you have to use his witness not so, your own witness how does he, how does rob and his witness know what label you're getting on your cgc book after the fact because that's because cho- they chosen. fill out the paperwork for you but they that's cho- cho- that's chosen after the fact though is it not it's a part of the app i think you have to put on the application is it really that, yeah that you want oh. that because you have to pay for that label so they they uh they would they weren't going to allow it um but you know it's one of those things uh, it, I think as convention season kicks up, it'll be interesting to see who feels the hurt more. Um, does Liefeld feel the heat or does CGC feel it? And I think, honestly, it's going to be a little bit of both. I think it's CBCS. Go ahead. There's a, per- there's a perfect uh, image of CBCS. They can just get Deadpool peeing on Scotty Young's head. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, uh, that's the image on the top. <laughs> Yep. I think this is great controversy to open up the con season. I think it's going to carry into the summer. And I think 
by the time fall hits, we'll all have forgotten about it and everything will be red as rain. So there it is, guys. Those are the topics for this show. Let us know in the comments what your thoughts are, especially for, we talked about Punchline. We, we talked about Bad Idea. We talked about limiting releases. We talked about Rob Liefeld and CGC. So comment, let us know what your thoughts are. But before we go, we have that lightning round with our panelists. We're gonna ask a series of questions. Each one's gonna answer with the first answer that pops into the head, starting with favorite character. Andy, go. Punisher. Ryan, go. Easy, Venom. Favorite writer. Andy, go. Ooh, uh, Jeff Lemire, Gideon Falls. It's gonna be Sir Cates for me. Favorite Johnny artist. Cates. Ooh, Fiona Staples. McFarlane, uh, back in the day, uh, I like Crane stuff right now. And favorite cover? Ooh. Um, the front. Punisher, Punisher Armory number one from Jim Lee. My all-time favorite cover ever. Most of the Virgin covers from Venom. All right. And then the last one, 2020 comic books to buy this year personal or whatever oh god uh saga the diamond retailer incentive saga number one that retailer incentive i gotta i gotta try to work my way to getting a copy of that that's affordable before saga comes back um and then i gotta finish out i've got two more two more copies of the image first apparently um image first saga was released three times there's like a 2012 and 2014 and i think like a 2016 or 2017 so as a completionist, I've got two more of those to find somewhere. And for me, uh, I'm looking forward to the uh, Web of Venom Wraith coming out. Uh, a couple of that with the, I'm also looking to get another set of Annihilation Conquest Wraith from 07. I want to try to upgrade the, the, the covers, the copies I have. I think that's going to be a good spec buy for, uh, in my Venom realm. So there it is. That's the first ever lightning round. Now, real quick, guys, starting with you, Andy, where can we find you on social media? Oh, boy. Uh, you guys can find me on the Comic Core every Monday night with Modern Men, my favorite show near and dear to my heart, where we talk about a lot of modern comics with some of the most amazing reads available uh, and out there today. And uh, you can find me on my own channel on YouTube, where I just posted today um, my uh, subscriber giveaway raffle. You can occasionally find me on the Simpleman's Comics channel family here too as well. And Ryan, we all know you have that awesome Facebook group. Tell us about the Facebook group and where else we can find you. Yeah, so we got uh, rhinos dot dot dot, which is basically a page built for the community so that you can uh, watch um, some unboxing, unboxings that I do or community members do, get to hear some different uh, informational stuff, uh, some spec things, stuff going on in the in the world of movies and whatnot. And again, it's in fa on Facebook at Rhinos, R-H-Y-N-O, R-H-Y-N-O, apostrophe S, dot, dot, dot. And the same thing on YouTube, it's Rhinos, but review. Uh, so that's basically giving me the same thing. That's a new channel. There's no content right now, but soon enough, you'll see uh, some uh, fun content. Uh, I'm thinking about doing some uh, channel reviews and I'm um, going to be doing Andy's challenge um, on the dead questions. Dad jokes. Dad jokes. That, ja mm -hmm. that dad joke contest, I'm looking forward to people putting in some videos. I'm going to put in some goods. I already did my research. <laughs> and also, we will put links in the description of this video for you guys to find all those social media accounts for Andy and Ryan. We want to thank both of you guys for being on our first episode of Simple Man's Comics and Friends. Man, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It was awesome. All right. All right. I'm glad we were able to break it in. Yeah, I love hanging out with you guys, man, anytime. So make sure you sub those guys up and be sure you are subscribed as well as hitting that bell for notifications for everything we do here on Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel. We are going to be bringing these podcasts to you on a bi-weekly basis, but on our off weeks, be on the lookout for that micro content where we're going to chop these hour-long episodes up into some small dissectable videos that really focus in on individualized topics. And of course, you can follow us and subscribe to us everywhere you find your audio podcasts. I'm talking Google Play, Stitcher, uh, iTunes. So be sure to check out that audio version of the podcast. Thank you guys for joining us tonight.
And with that being said, this is Brian, Jack, Andy, and Ryan. And we will see you guys on the next podcast.